This is a conversation with coach and speaker Marcus Ogden. He's a former NFL football player and now a super successful entrepreneur. In this capacity, he worked for 40 Fortune 100 companies and he wrote several best-selling books about success and his personal story. Actually, he went bankrupt with his first business and he describes what he learned from going from eight figures to $8 per hour working as a janitor and back to a super successful businessman. His decisive turnaround moment was when he was picking up a bag of trash and it had splashed all over him in his clothes. An amazing, very inspiring story. Hit the like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it. So you have a, quite an interesting story. You have been a professional NFL football player, an athlete, and then you became an entrepreneur, uh, had a construction company, uh, then you went bankrupt and it, this business failed. And mm -hmm. then you came back up and now you have like this amazing success with uh, being an author, speaker, um, entrepreneur, podcaster, etc. So that, that's very interesting because m most people cannot really recover from, you know, being kind of destroyed. And um, so I respect that a lot. How, how did you actually become an NFL player? That's a great question, Sven. Thanks for asking. So for me, I played football in high school, in college. My brother, Jonathan Ogden, was the Ravens, the Baltimore Ravens' first NFL draft pick ever in 1996. So I was around the game for many, many years. Of course, being a younger brother, I adored and I followed my older brother and what he did. And I wanted to play football ever since I really could remember but I was too big to play any earlier. And my middle school did not have football. We only had basketball. So mm -hmm. I ended up not playing football until my freshman year of high school. And my talent was average at best. And then when I got to mm. college, I grew to be about six foot six. I'm six, five and a half, six, six. And I took a red shirt year, which means I didn't play. I practiced all that stuff. And I became a four year starter at Howard University. And Learned a lot from my coach, who was an NFL offensive lineman his, himself, Fred mm -hmm. Dean. And I worked hard, Sven. I dedicated myself. I disciplined myself. And I ended up becoming a NFL athlete. Uh, I was drafted in 2003 by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how does that actually work? So you kind of excel in things like high school or college football, and then people... Mm -hmm. Pick, kind of pick you and then they Correct. kind of recruit you? How does that actually work? Great question. So what happens is you play high school football, you do really well, then the colleges start to look at you and recruit you mm. and they want to sign you. So I was then signed by Howard. And then going into my last year, a lot of NFL teams like the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Indianapolis Colts, the Cincinnati Bengals, they started coming to Howard to watch me play my games and looked at my, my background and my mental capacity, my ability to have a strong character and be a good person. They start you know, doing all their due diligence. And then you go to like different bowl games or then you have what's called either a uh, the NFL combine where you go to Indianapolis, you do all types of drills, like 225 pound bench press, run a 40 yard dash, do position drills, foot quickness drills, all that kind of stuff. And what happens is, As you do well in that, then they want to come and talk to you about your, again, your education. How do you do as far as your mental capacity, ability to learn, all those things. So it really is a full comprehensive you know, approach. And what I tell people is it takes a lot of time for them to want to evaluate you to be able to get a good idea, right, Sven, if you're going to fit their football team. So it's not just you go play football and you're done. You have to play great football. You have to show you have great you know, ability to do drills. You have to show you have a good, strong educational background. There's a lot of things that go into being dragged into the National Football League. That That's interesting. Do you think it's a good idea to look for all these traits? Uh, and why, why is it like important how you do like mentally and um, in your courses and, and, and lessons and exams for a football player why is that important That's a great question Smith, because you have to be able to pick up a playbook 
right? You just don't go out there and do plays like you do like you're a kid in, in the sandlot. They have formations, plays, audibles. Everything goes into a playbook. And a playbook in the National Football League is very big. It's a lot. And if you don't have a good, strong educational ability to show, you can pick up things quickly. You're smart. You can adapt. You can pivot. They feel you will not be able to handle that NFL playbook. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's been a lot of great athletes, right? Spen played college football, who did well in college, but then got to the National Football League. They didn't adjust well to pick up the playbook. And if you can't Mm. adjust and pick up the playbook, you are not going to be successful in the National Football League. So they want to test your mental ability to see if you can actually pick up and comprehend the playbook, which is a very important part of being a professional football player. I see. And do you think this approach makes sense? Um, do Do you also... Do like do you also take let's say lessons and learnings from that for your own recruiting when you recruit people for your team? Yes, now today absolutely because I want people that are going to be you know adaptable, smart, team oriented, community share information absolutely because if people don't have that capability, right, Sven? Then what happens is they're not going to work well within the team structure. So what I learned in the National Football League has helped me greatly in my construction business. The only problem I had spent there was I became really ego driven. I tell people all the time, there's confidence, which is the good part of your soul. You should be proud of yourself, who you are, what you've done. Your ego is the bad part of your soul because you start feeling that you're untouchable, you can do no wrong, that you're always right. I was watching something yesterday on a guy named John Brown, who was a abolitionist back in the 1800s. They say John Brown failed in business because he always thought he was right. He never felt that if something went wrong, he never took accountability. So he always said, well, was that person's fault and that person's fault. And That's what happened to me with my construction company. I grew a nice team, had a great business, but because I was not prepared for that success that came my way, I grew an ego. It got bigger than a good part of my soul, right, Sven? I ended up making a lot of mistakes. Boom, I go bankrupt. Okay, thanks. So that was now the jump to uh, being an entrepreneur. Um I would like to get into detail a little bit later um, regarding this topic. Uh, what I'm interested in is like um, how, like, like, f- what, what kind of lessons did you take from the NFL and from being a football player to then, like, later in life f- for your business and for your life? The best piece of advice, Ben, that I took from the National Football League was from my coach, Jack Del Rio. He said, if you want to be successful in life, you have to be your own CEO, your Mm -hmm. own chief executive officer. Like he said, you are not going to have it where the Jaguars are going to tell you, be here early at this time, stay late after practice to this time. Go into the community, right, Sven, and meet people and engage people. All these things. He could, we can tell you what time to be in for practice, what time practice is over, work your butt off on the field, in the classroom. But once time is done, you can go home. And so Jack told us as rookies, because was, he was a rookie mm. head coach in the National Football League. If you want to be successful, gentlemen, you have to be your own CEO. And that was the best advice I ever got spent because once I left the NFL, I took that advice, started my own company, and I grew a very successful business. Where I messed up, like I said earlier, mm. is the ego of me got bigger than the good part of me. But Jack's advice and Jack's lesson of be your own CEO, Sven, that was absolutely the best piece of advice that I ever got in the National Football League. Okay, thank you. That that sounds good. So, so what does it actually mean to be your own CEO? Does it mean like, is it just like that you take responsibility a little bit more or 
what what does what does it precisely mean? It precisely means you need to be self-inspired to do what is necessary, not motivated. I tell everybody when you're motivated, you're doing something for the short term or for external mm. factors like money, fame, notoriety. Being your own CEO spend means being self-inspired to do what you know you need to do to get where you want. I have a saying, you have to do what you hate to get mm -hmm. what you want. And that's what being your own CEO means. It means getting up early, staying late, out working the competition. Nobody has to tell me, right, Spin? Get up at this time. Go do this. I go mm. to the gym, Spin. I, I work out seven days a week. I live really? six. I do. Absolutely, I do. Because this my body is part of my job as a speaker, a coach, mm. a consultant. If I don't take care of myself, right, Spin? How can people say, well, how are you going to take care of me? If you can't take care of you, how are you going to take care of me? So that's what being your own CEO really is about. It's about being self-inspired to do what you know you need to do, and nobody has to tell you to do it. And that's what it really means to be your own CEO. I see. So yeah, it's it's like um, for anyone who is an employee, uh, it's very. I think it's very detrimental for people who just think that they're working for their boss, because in my opinion, you're really working for yourself. And being an employee or an entrepreneur is just a vehicle. It's just you're a different, uh, you're a different um, wheel in the machinery. You're just you. You also have your functions. You also have your duties, and you you have to work well. And if you really become your own CEO, and if you really go, let's say. If you re really learn to over deliver towards yourself and towards others, towards the company you're work working for and with, towards your uh, customers, towards your colleagues, then you automatically will have a better life, a better career, et cetera, et cetera. They will all come back. So I totally agree with this, uh, being your own CEO with going the extra mile. I mean, nobody, for example, tells you to go work out seven days a week. You do it nope. because you are your own CEO, and um, yeah, that's gotten you a long way. So, how how did you become an entrepreneur? So, because it's very like kind of like yeah, it's almost random to to be a, a an athlete and then to kind of start a construction company. That's pretty unusual. So, how how did that happen for you? Spin after the NFL for about six months, I struggled with addiction alcoholism, gambling, nightlife, all the things bad. And finally, after six months, I put the bottle down and I said, okay, what am I going to do with my life? For so long, Spin, I was always being told where to be, where to go, all that. Like with football, I was a college athlete. I was an NFL athlete. So I was always on the clock. I said, okay, I've got some money put away. I've worked hard. I don't know where I belong in corporate America. Like I have a degree in finance, but I haven't used it in so long. What can I do to work within myself? And I realized that myself was good with people. I like to network and I was really good at communicating. And so I met somebody who was in the business and then he introduced me to my business partner who had about 30 years of experience in construction. And we decided to launch a business in 2008. And we literally just said, hey, here we are. Let's go for this. And there was a huge need spin for contractors in Baltimore City. That's where I lived. Mm -hmm. And I went there because I was a former Raven. And my brother was a Raven also. So our last name was very popular and still is today in Baltimore. So I wanted to go there to try to, you know, network and use that to mm. leverage for business. And that's how I got started. So I knew I wanted to do something not in the corporate scene. And I ended up getting into the business. I met my business partner and we went off and running. I see. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's kind of smart for me to use your con 
your your contacts and your reputation, your name. I think that helps a lot. That's why I started dentistry because uh, before I became, let's say, an, a software entrepreneur and uh, an online marketer and things like that. Because uh, I was like, somehow my best friends were are, are all sons of dentists. <laughs> so I I started that. I wanted to play it safe. I was I know I figured a dentist cannot really fall very uh steep because a dentist will always be a dentist whereas i saw people you know having studied and good degrees and good um grades at being a lawyer or i mean law degree and and uh, business uh, mbas and stuff like that but some of them ended up uh at a, as a cashier in a grocery shop and stuff like that i i've seen this all so i was like okay if i'm a dentist then I will always be in a dentist. Even a bad dentist. Bad dentist works in a clinic because you you don't have that time pressure. You don't have to be super efficient. You can be like super slow and just work on one patient per like uh, for, for half day. It, it doesn't matter in a clinic. Whereas like in a free practice, then you're in 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 a, a free market. Then that would be a little bit tough. So yeah, I can I can understand that. So um, you 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 said that your ego is responsible the bad part of you for your first failure so to speak mm -hmm. how how so exactly so spin all the success we were having we were the largest african-american subcontractor in the city of baltimore in the area of site work for two mm. years we were winning awards we were we were making a ton of money we were an eight-figure business but what happened is once people around me started to tell me how good I was. Instead of saying, thank you, I appreciate it, I said, you know what? I am that good. I am that great. I am that person. I am the king of Baltimore. You're right. And that's how my attitude started to go from being confident, like saying I'm good a contractor, I'm responsible, which is a good thing to be. I went to like arrogance and ego and superiority and you couldn't tell me anything. You couldn't tell me how to handle this. You couldn't tell me how to talk and do that, right? You couldn't tell me anything. And as a result of that, right, Sven, my ego became the size of King Kong. And mm -hmm. once my ego got so big where people couldn't tell me anything, people stopped talking to me. And when they stopped talking to me, I started making bad mistakes. I started to, I got into one big job where I spent about $3 million of my money in 90 days, unexpectedly, thought I was going to get paid back by the client. I did not because my ego said, oh, Marcus, you're the minority contractor. They love you. They're never going to hurt you. They're going to take care of you. And I made a really big mistake, Sven. I did extra work on a job without a signed contract, without a signed mm. change order. I took the word of the client. And now today I totally accept all the responsibility. But at that time, once they screwed me and I went bankrupt, I was like, oh, poor me. They took, they took advantage of me, which they did. But that's business. People are going to always spend, watch out for their bottom line profit and money of, over yours that's just the way the world works oh, i see so what what if i understand you correctly it was like they just told you verbally to do stuff that you executed oh, that of course you have as a contractor you, you got to pay for this first and then they didn't remember and was like hey where's the contract and you just assumed that oh yeah uh of course, they will pay for it and, and agree to, to the terms that you uh, need later. Interesting. So, you got it. Mm, yeah, that's that's a good advice right there for anyone listening. You always, in my opinion, you always have to do the formal paperwork, even if you're really friendly with other people. And even if, you know, it's like, 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 uh, up even, even for a marriage, it's always good to have, like, let's say an, an exit strategy and, and, a prenup or something like that um, because you know later on there can be I mean it's just like part of being a human that things are up for interpretation right so better do your due diligence and, and the paperwork and everything nicely 
because otherwise th this is like one of the most dangerous things in business and in life that can get you in trouble that you don't uh, do the paperwork and don't like if, if you don't don't stick to deadlines and stuff that's that's just de destructive oh yeah absolutely and this is what i say to my clients right spin learn from me so you don't end up like me every job stands alone don't worry about or don't try to rely on what you did for somebody else in the past and then do a new job for that same client thinking because they took care of you on one job mm. they're going to take care of you on the next job because i am living proof that did not happen and because i was so ego and arrogant driven it cost me everything i own in 2013. Hmm. that that's really Yeah, that's really crazy. Um, and did you have any feelings of like you wanted revenge or you wanted wanted to hurt them or if if you blamed them back then? Oh, of course. I mean, I didn't want to. I mean, I wanted to like get revenge and sue them and try to get my money mm. back, but I was so broke, right, Spin? That was mm. not even a possibility. I had nothing left. So literally, I was just. I was. I had four hundred dollars to my name. Once I moved down to Raleigh, North Carolina, after losing everything in that construction company. Okay, I see. And one, what happened next? So, so you uh, kind of went bankrupt and couldn't pay the bills. What, what was next? Uh, so I moved down to Raleigh. Got to Raleigh. I the, the NFL PA uh, and the NFL Player Care Foundation helped me find a job in Raleigh. Got down here, and I was about to go homeless, but the NFL gave me a grant called the Gene Upshaw Trust Fund, and they paid four months of my bills to my creditor. Mm -hmm. They paid my rent, my cars, all the things I couldn't pay, because if I didn't get their help, then I was going to go homeless. And I got their help, and I was working at Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor in their PMD program, like their starter program. I wasn't doing well with my practice tests. I got fired. I went to a construction company the next day to get a job, got a job, was fired from that job five days later. So I was fired two times in the same week. The only job I could get spent other than teaching kids football, I became a custodian working from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. One of our signature, one of our signature keynote spin that we do for our clients is called mm -hmm. the e the ego mistake from eight figures to eight twenty five per hour, and I mm -hmm. talk about how I lost everything, and then I was working as a custodian for eight twenty five an hour, and I was still spend blaming the contractor, my partner, the developer, the owner, everybody's fault but Marcus, and then God said, okay, Marcus. This is your final rock bottom moment to either realize that you made the mistake and fix it or sit here for the rest of your life complaining about what you don't have anymore because you didn't watch your eyes. So you didn't dot your eyes. You didn't cross your teeth. Mm. So I had what I would call my rock bottom moment of clarity spin when somebody's trash, rotten meat, nasty, protruding garbage got on my body my skin and my clothes, right? Spent as a custodian mm -hmm. taking the trash out at about 4.30, oh. 5 o'clock in the morning. I was doing my job, working my shift. Went to throw the trash in the dump, throw it, but there was a rip on the front side of the bag, Spin All that trash came right back on me. I went home and I said, what the hell has happened to my life? And that's when I said, if I don't take accountability and responsibility right now, Right, Spin? I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. So I wrote down my three biggest strengths. And at that time, Spin, I launched and I said, wow, what the heck? Let's try being a keynote speaker. Tony Robbins was a janitor. He did it. How hard could it be? And that's when I launched my speaking career on the side while still doing custodial work, football training, birthday clown at birthday parties, all these things just to pay the bills. Oh, I, I see. So, uh, so 
I, I think that's very unusual because like uh, you kind of immediately knew what to do, like writing down your strength and then choosing like a new career path. Uh, for me, it's a bit unusual because, you know, like usually people would be like just paralyzed and shocked and wouldn't know what to do. Uh, how come you had this intuition and this guidance to 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 have like this step right at the, at the same day, like kind of on the spot? Because Sven, I, because Sven, that's a good question. I was tired of being tired and I was tired of blaming everybody around me, but me. And I mm -hmm. knew the path I was on was only going to get me to mediocrity. And I said, mm -hmm. if I don't fix this, I'm never going to get a life that I deserve, but also my fiance, who's now my wife and my stepdaughter. And now, of course, I have a daughter. She's uh, should be eight on Monday. And I said, they deserve a better life. So I said, if I'm going to rebuild myself, right, Sven, I need to mm. rebuild myself off of things that I do well. And that's how I got started in the speaking business because I said, hmm, I'm a good communicator. I like to help people and I'm a good storyteller. And that's what said, all right, Marcus, this is something you should try to do because you have, because you know, at that time, so I, on my, during my work, I was listening to podcasts like, you know, Tony Robbins, Les Brown. So these people helped me get through my shifts working as a custodian uh, when I was going through that dark period uh, here in, in, you know, in early September. Uh huh. Yeah, that, that's really remarkable because those are, this is a very competitive field. There is a lot of, You know, people who write books, who uh, give speeches, who are, who are speakers, uh, who do po podcasting. So this is a very, very competitive field. What what made you so? So it was just like focusing on your strength that that kind of gave you the belief that in spite of that, all that competition, including your idols, Tony Robbins, etc., um, you could do well in that field. Great question. So for the first few years, I got no paid speaking jobs. Got my mm. first paid speaking job in April 2016. It took me two and a half years to get my first paid speaking job. And I remember meeting one of my mentors. Her name is Mel Robbins, a very successful mm. speaker. And Mel said, Marcus, the problem right now is you're trying to be like everybody else. You need mm. to create your own USP, your unique yeah. selling proposition. And once I learned how to do that spin and I was coached and got better, now over the last, since 2016 with my first paid job, we've worked for 40 Fortune 500 companies as a speaker. 40. Nice. Wow. And I'm, four, and I'm 41 years old. And we've worked for universities and NFL teams and all this stuff. But how we got there, Spin, it's a building block process, one at a time. And I tell everybody, in order to be successful, focus on the end result. What uh -huh. do you want? Focus on where you want to be, not the day-to-day -day grind that you're going through. Because if you focus on the day-to-day -day grind, you need to execute the day-to-day -day grind. But don't focus on it because if you do, you can say, oh, I'm not going anywhere today. Oh, nobody's talking mm. to me. Oh, I'm not getting anywhere. And what I've done is I focus on the long game, like years down the road, right? I, I know I would have to do operationally, but I'm also a visionary focused person because I'm like, well, in a year, I could do this, this, and this, right? And what happens is the day-to-day -day things don't become as much of a grind anymore. They become things that you look forward to doing to get where you want to go. Wow, that's interesting. But w what if like, what if your long-term vision is a bit too intimidating? Hmm. And you know what? If, if it's not intimidating, then it's not worth it. How do you think I felt starting speaking? Like, gee, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've been doing this for nine years. So your long-term vision is supposed to be intimidating. It's supposed to scare you. Otherwise, mm. you're not dreaming big enough. Great quote by Jonah Hill, the actor. The comfort mm. zone is where dreams go to die. So you're not supposed to have a 
big vision be small. Otherwise, it's not Mm -hmm. a vision, right? So if you're intimidated by your dreams, your objectives, you're on the right path. Now what you need to do is break down either daily, weekly, monthly, however you want to do it, to figure out a plan to get from A to B, B to C. Because again, Stan, when I started speaking in 2013, like it was a huge vision. Like, who the hell am I? I'm a former NFL athlete. I'm not Peyton Manning. I'm not, you know, Tom Brady. Nobody knows my name. Like, I'm not my brother who's a Hall of Famer. I don't have any real merit. Like, nobody knows me. So saying, oh, I'm a former NFL player, that's not going to do anything for anybody. I don't care. Mm. So I had to actually humble myself and start at the bottom. Like literally spent, I started doing all kinds of free jobs for boys and girls clubs, uh, Pop Warner football teams, middle school sports, high school sports. I mean, you know, non for profit. I mean, I started spent at the complete bottom. And that's mm. exactly what you're supposed to do in order to get to the vision. But just break it down where it doesn't seem as intimidating. But if it's not mm. intimidating to you, then I feel it's not something you should be really striving to go for anyway. I see. So, but how about negativity? How about like, if you're like, okay, this is my courageous goal. And then you're like, you have to, all this negativity and the, this negative self-talk. How, how, how can you deal with that ideally? Something I read in a book and I practice it and it works great for that exact question. Get rid of old baggage. Shred it in your mind or interrupt it if, a bad, if an old thought comes up that's negative. What I tell yeah. people is that in order to get where you want to go, you are not required to be the same person you were five or ten minutes ago. You don't have to be yeah. the same person. So if old negative thoughts come into your mind, shred them. Get a mental shredder, go and, and cut them all and cut them up. And I tell you, Sven, uh-huh. that works for me because like, oh man, I didn't get that job. It's gone. Hey, I got that job. Great, it's here. Hey, I, that client didn't take my call. On to the mm. next. Like, you know, you gotta just move on. Yo, know, old baggage, negativity, it will hold you down and it'll it'll affect. This is how I got ended up with my with my new podcast. My co-host and I, great guy. But we had a little bit of parting ways because he had an emotional phone call. And when we had a call right after that, he didn't shred the baggage. And he didn't really just say, Bleh. he kind of let it mm. affect him. And it came into our call and it affected some things that we were growing together. So I tell people all the time, you cannot let negativity, self-doubt, all that hold you back. Because again, old baggage is something you have to dump and get rid of. Otherwise, it'll hold you down, pull you down, where you can't go forward for what you want in your life. Okay, thank you. Um, I see. Yeah, it's yeah, ne- this negativity. Yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes with me, sometimes it kind of creeps up with just a bad feeling. It's not like really, you know, it it's kind of tricky with, with my mind, you know? Like, my mind is like, Okay, it, it knows that it cannot like come up as like a phrase or an image. It can just it, it just creeps up with like a negative feeling and and to to be even be aware of that is, is like it's quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well here's the thing. Negativity loves isolation. So if you want to also get rid of those thoughts, get a community of people that are gonna be supportive of you. That helps you also get rid of that negativity and self-doubt because I have a great team now. If I'm having a bad day or a rough day, I call one of my team members, poof, I'm picked right back up. And that's the same thing anybody can do. Surround yourself with a team that's supportive, that actually wants you to do well. Ah, that's that's interesting. That's cool. Thank you. Um, You mentioned your USP and and that you found an USP. Um, what's your USP and how did you exactly find it? Our USP is that we have gone through the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs. It was an eight-figure company, went Hmm. bankrupt in 90 days. I have had success. I have had failure. But our USP is you hire our brand to inspire you to take accountability. 
through my mistakes, through my failures, my lessons learned, you could be efficient through either a speaking for your organization, consulting, coaching, all that. So you don't end up like I did in my first business. Uh -huh. That's very cool. And how, how can, how can, so how, what's, what's the mechanism, the structure behind it? If I want to find my USP or a better USP for myself, uh, what, what do you tell your mentees, your coaches that you're coaching to be able to do that for them? Create your own specific narrative, your own specific either keynote or your message based off your story. Uh -huh. Best thing I've learned from Mel Robin, if you're a motivational speaker, you're done because there's a lot of those out there. I'll get yeah. you rah-rah fired up and boom, you're done. If you want to be the best, be an inspirational keynote speaker, somebody that can inspire with words, messaging, all that. So for you, if you're listening, what is your unique story? For me, from eight figures to 825 per hour. We had an eight-figure mm. business, boom, everything went 825 per hour versus custodian. One of our, our leadership talk is called self-absorption causes self-destruction. I got so self-absorbed in my success, my money, my fame, poof, cost me everything. One of our marketing and sales talks is called Drop the Poker Face. Selling requires authenticity. I love to play poker. I'm authentic. My new podcast is called Get Authentic with Marcus. So we have created mm -hmm. things that only can be told by us. So if you're trying to find your USP, don't say I'm a leadership speaker. Don't say like uh, I do speech on culture. Find something in your leadership me you know, mechanism that you do that you know only you really do well and then create something from there. And that's your unique selling proposition. I see. Thank you. Yeah. The thing about the unique selling proposition is also that it has to be like, there has to be like a certain demand for it. And a lot of people are kind of afraid of, you know, being too specific. They, they like to be, Oh, I can solve any problem for anyone rather than saying, Hey, uh, for this group of people, I can solve this very one specific thing. A problem um, because they're afraid of losing clients, right? Mm -hmm. Greatest thing I learned is one of the one of the ten things that most small businesses do wrong in their marketing. They are not specific to the yeah. target audience they're trying to get in front of, yeah. and that's where you have to. There's nothing wrong with being able to solve a lot of problems, right? But figure out who or what type of client or avatar client is going to be best fit. Right, Sven, to have you solve all types of problems that they might have. And that's how you end up getting more specific in your marketing and get going down the path that you want to go down. I see. Thank you. Um, so uh, you, you, so far you've mentioned only negative things about the concept of ego. Um, how do you see ego like? like holistically is it just a negative thing um is it is it something that we have to fight or is there also are there also situations in which an ego is helpful let's say for example as an athlete maybe maybe because of your ego you overcome your opponent stuff like that um how so, do you see uh, that so so here's the thing right ego is in your body right ego yeah. is fine as long as it doesn't get bigger than the confidence or you being very strong and very proud of who you are. As long as it stays within the, that, that realm, there's nothing wrong because everybody has an ego, right? The thing is, though, you can't let your ego get bigger than the good part of your soul. Once mm. that happens, once it becomes where your ego is like taking over, Then it becomes bad. But if you keep it in check and you have a little bit of ego, a little bit, you know, a little bit of swagger, stuff like that, but it's not all the time. And you're here's the thing, right? If you have a little ego, but you still will listen to people, you're fine. The minute mm. you feel you can't listen to anybody, right, Sven, you won't take any advice or any constructive criticism, that's when you know you're in trouble. 
Uh -huh. I see. So yeah, with the ego, sometimes I feel it <laughs> like where I feel my ego the most is when I'm driving a car and someone kind of provokes me. <laughs> But, I, I, mean, like, yeah, I mean, that's road rage, brother. I mean, I, I yeah. hear that. But, you know, but at the end of the day, like I said, like, you know, but you're not saying, oh, Spins the man. He's the best. He's this. He's like, you know, you're just like, eh, it's my piss me off. I have a little ego. That's fine. You know what I'm saying? But again, that's minor. You're not saying, oh, yeah. Spins the best. And he's all awesome. Like, I literally used to say, Spin Marcus is the best. I'm awesome. No one can speak. Mm. I mean, and, and that's how my ego just took over my soul. And once that happened, Spin, it was downhill from there. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think it's very, very um, bad if you're not able to blame yourself for anything. I think this is like the the surest way to failure. If you're unable to blame yourself for stuff that goes wrong, because <laughs> because ultimately you're you're the reason if if, if things go wrong, even Thank if you. someone screwed you. Totally. Correct. And that's right. why I said when I got screwed by the developer and contractor, once yeah. I had my spoiled milk moment, rock my moment of clarity, I said, Marcus, it wasn't their fault. It was yours. You did the extra work without a change order and they took advantage of you. Yes, they did. But you were oh. the one that did the work first. So it was your fault, your mistake. You need to own it. I have a saying, if you make a mistake, own it, fix it move on i see thank you how did you manage to become so successful as a speaker and work with these fortune 100 uh, companies uh, how did that happen for you the art of networking i used to coach kids in football one of my fir my first fortune 500 speaking client was a company called netapp did a speaking job for them got a reference letter got to another company and another company and another company and this networked and I created mm. more value with my speeches and I got more better at content. I got better at delivery, got better at messaging and pop, 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 pop. Here we are now, you know, six years later, 40 Fortune 500 companies of the 40, mm. 15 are Fortune 100, six are Fortune 25. But again, it didn't happen overnight. It took time and time and time. And now through networking and marketing and branding and being consistent, here we are today. I see. What's what's your long-term plan, like a vision of yourself? Because you reached so much, what, what, like what you can reach uh, as an accomplishment in that realm, being a speaker and an inspirational speaker and et cetera. Like what's your personal goal? Like what's your long-term vision? So for me, it is to grow the online portion of our business. And then really, we started a new podcast, which is having mm -hmm. great success. We were ranked in the top 100 sports, all sports category on, uh, on Apple in less than, a, less than a day. So it's mm -hmm. really, really wow. big in that regard. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is build that part of our brand and have it match what we're doing speaking wise. So we're really excited about our new podcast. We're really excited about what we're working on to, on the online side of our business to be able to create that that residual income to really be able to help as many people mm. as we can that can't afford our high ticket coaching, consulting, or speaking, but they want some things from us to help them get where they want to go in their life. Ah, uh -huh, I see. So is it about online courses and uh, or? Um uh, online courses or online classes or stuff like that or yeah that. online course online classes things like that subscription based yeah creating that part of the brand where it becomes mm -hmm. more full functioning where we don't have to be there and help people who are you know trying to get that that entry point that can't afford the higher the higher price i see um you also um you're also a best selling author and I think so many people would like to write a book. Um, how do you approach, like, like if I want to write a best-selling book, how can I, how can I do that? How would you advise me to approach that? I would advise you to write a, a query letter and then find a great publisher. 
A great mm-hmm. publisher has all the contacts to help you get out in front of more leads, more, you know, more articles, more book, you know, book, you know, um, you know, uh, products where people can see you and market you. And once you find mm-hmm. that, then write a really great manuscript. And the manuscript has to be something that either is entertaining or is educational that's going to inspire people. And once you've done that and you have the right publisher who can help you get into bookstores and all that kind of great stuff, that's how you get into that position. But it's very hard because right now, a lot of people want to write books, right, Sven? But there aren't a lot of great publishing houses out there that can help you get that network where you're trying to go in that regard. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I think it's yeah, writing a bestseller is it's also about, you know, having yeah, having having like contacts and a network that helps you with sales because your book has to be sold in a certain number and there's a a cool guy uh, named T- Tyler Wagner who uh mentioned that like like the system um you need you need to you know make a campaign and have like maybe a discounted sale for your book uh, for a lower price and then people might buy it during a specific time frame i think there is there is cool stuff but yeah i think it's also pro- probably it's good if you're if you have like a really catchy title sure if it's kind of unique because you know there's so many books out there again it's hard for me to like find that angle that's going to be successful i think because that's why i think it's a great accomplishment that you did it over and over again <laughs> appreciate it man it's all about your network it's all about your positioning mm. to get where you want to go without a doubt cool um you you mentioned that you have to like create your own storyline can you elaborate on that a little bit please so so how can i create my own story script You have to create your narrative based off your story that Mm -hmm. you know will help people get things accomplished that they're struggling with. And once you do that, you then Mm -hmm. want to use that and position yourself to be able to get more people to want to work with you to that regard, to that level. So again, creating your own narrative is really about creating your own position where people who are having problems know if they contact you, that you can help solve their problems. That's like how we Mm, do with our different keynotes and all that. That's why we're getting booked more because if you have, if you want something on professional development, we have a keynote, something on marketing, Mm. we have a keynote, something on culture, we have a keynote. So we've created our own different narratives and people go to our website, they see that to be able to say, yep, I want to buy that from Marks. I want to buy that from Marks. I want this for 15,000. I want that for 10,000. Mm. And that's how it goes from there. I see. And um, if you had to start all over again, would you have chosen this exact same career path again? Like, or would without, you have made with, different decisions? With, with, without a doubt, I stay the same path because this is my calling. This is what I love to do. And I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine spend doing anything else other than what I'm doing right now. Okay. Yeah. I can't really see you being totally passionate about this. This is very oh, nice. I, I, lo- I love it. It's, it's, it's my passion. It's my drive. It's what I love to do to help people get to where they want to go in their life. Oh, that's very cool. Um, do you think, do you think if you hadn't been a professional athlete, uh, that your life would be different right now? Sure, absolutely, because being a professional athlete opened a lot of doors, but Mm. being a professional athlete has not made me who I am in my new career because people don't care, right? You have to bring value to clients. not going to pay me 15, 20 grand because, oh, tell me a football story. Absolutely not. (laughs) They want to know how can I help them with their problem. Mm. So, yeah, football helped a little bit, but where I'm at today, football has had nothing to do with my brand because – I don't even talk about football anymore. Like, you know, I really don't talk about it a whole lot because it really doesn't have anything to do with my story. Well, I mentioned a little bit when I'm doing my keynotes, like 30 seconds, but it's more yeah. about my business, my failure, my up and down, yeah. because that is exactly what makes the difference in my life in that regard. I see. Yes. Um, I think you're, you're, you seem very structured. 
um, how do you structure your day and your week? Um, what, what does a typical day and week uh, for you look like? I mean, I live by my calendar. So, like, I, I yeah. go to the gym every morning at uh, 5.30 in the morning. I, have my, I take my daughter to camp or wherever it has to be done. I do my sales calls. I shoot my podcast. I've got your podcast. I've got another podcast here to, in a few minutes. I'm always mm. on the grind. I'm always – I live by my schedule. I'm doing this or that. And then I have a great team. We meet twice a week and we go over stuff. And, you know, I've got all this different stuff lined up. But it's the schedule. And that's where in the beginning, Spin, when I was struggling as a speaker, I had no schedule. I had no time management. Once I put that into my business, into my life, my days flow a lot smoother, a lot more efficiently. And now here we are in this position of having a very successful brand in that regard. Oh, thank you. That was very valuable. Um, so you must be very disciplined. Do you have... Uh, as, as kind of a last question, do you have like tips on how to master yourself and have self-discipline? Master yourself by mastering your subconscious. Number one, visualize. If you mm -hmm. see it and you want it, go after it. Pay attention to what you feed your subconscious. It needs great picture images, great thoughts, great perspective. And third, Be very careful who you tell your real subconscious inner thoughts and desires to. People that love you and want to help you, tell it to them all day. People, if you're not sure about them or you're hesitant, don't tell them. Because what will happen is they'll use it against you to help keep you from where you want to be and successful track record. Thank you very much. Um How how can someone, if, if they want to uh, learn more about you or contact you, how can they reach you the best? Yeah, they can go to our website, Spin, www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. And they can also send me an email, marcus at marcusogden.com. Get in touch with us. We'd love to speak with you. Marcus, thank you so much. That was a great conversation. I think uh, people will appreciate it. And I'm really curious about uh, the reaction of the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Sven, thank you very much, my friend. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.